Hello, my name is Mark and I thank you so much for coming by today. Well, if you're like me, you've been painting for a long time, or even if you're not and you've just started painting, there's one thing we all have in common, and that is we make mistakes. And uh, <laughs> I, I can say from experience that I've made enough mistakes in my life that I should know what I'm doing by now perfectly. But you know what? I still continue to make mistakes. And often they're the same mistakes that I've been making for years. Why is that? Well, there's a variety of reasons, but the main reason is because I usually just leave myself a very short window of time to be creative and to sit down with a painting and it's something that I rush through or I don't thoroughly plan it out or I'm not using my materials the way they're supposed to. Now, this painting that I'm, I'm doing for the video here, I'm doing this not to show you the mistakes, but to let you see the mistakes as they unfold. Now, it's not that I'm making a lot of mistakes here, but I'll go through it as, as we go along here and you'll see it kind of as I'm talking about it. But what happens here is that I have this uh, handbook, travelogue handbook journal it's not watercolor paper, so it's not meant to take a heavy load of water. It's great for drawing and it's great for light washes, but it's not meant for this kind of heavy watercolor payout. And so that's going to have an impact on the final piece. Uh, whether or not that's, that's kind of beside the point, because I should know that by now, but I, I, still, I still paint this thing pretty heavy. But what I want to talk about here is the mistakes that I continue to make, and maybe you can relate to these. There's a ton of videos and a ton of internet articles on, you know, the biggest mistakes in watercolor and the top five mistakes you're making and how to fix them. I urge you to go read those articles and watch those other videos because you'll find that some of the things that I'm talking about here will be in those videos as well. And they may have other stuff that they're talking about that might be useful for you as well. This stuff that I'm talking about today, these, these mistakes and so forth, these are mistakes that I find that I'm constantly making and that I forget sometimes when I'm rushing or when I'm not preparing myself properly. And um, that's what I want to get into today is just from my perspective, what I think the biggest mistakes most watercolor artists make and what I've seen students make in the classroom and again what I'm doing wrong and what mistakes I make and you know there's ways to fix these things and that's fine but I'm mostly going to just talk about the mistakes that I, I see myself making so let's get right into it and the first thing that I'll talk about is when I decide to use cheap materials. Now, what that means is I have a lot of really nice watercolor paper from Arches to Legion to Fabriano. But for some reason, when I'm, I'm feeling in this mood, I pull, a, I pull out some Canson or some Strathmore, some you know paper that cost me like $8. And I realize that this paper is really cheap. And once I get working with it, I realize, oh, this is really cheap paper and it, I don't like this. But sometimes I am tentative when I, I reach for paper because I don't want to use my good paper. I don't want to use like the best stuff I have. So I end up using the cheap stuff and then I regret it afterwards. <laughs> so uh, that's one side of the coin. The other side is using cheap paints. Uh, if you're going to use cheap paints, you're going to get kind of cheap results. But that's okay. So if you're comfortable working with, say, a Crayola you know, $2 or $3 paint set, then you know what you're getting into. You know what you're working with. If you go to Michael's and you buy the Reeves, you know, set of 12 tubes, then you know you're getting student grade. But if you go out and you buy Schmincke or you buy Daniel Smith or you buy M. Graham or Holbein or whatever, you know that those are more expensive and you're going to get sort of higher expect expectation results, I guess. I'm not sure how to say it. You know that the results are going to be a little bit better than cheaper paints, or sometimes they're going to be a lot better. And what I've seen from students is, uh, you know, in schools, we used to use Reeves, and Reeves were just not fun to work with because they just didn't have that power that some of these other brands have. And I remember bringing in a set for a set of my Daniel Smith watercolors for a student. And I said, you know, you have such a great style. I want to see what you can do with some really good watercolors. And so the student took these and they were kind of blown away and didn't know how to control them. It was too much for them. So they were trying to use it, the Daniel Smith paints, the way that they were using the Reeves. And it was totally different for them. So it took them a lot of 
a lot of like working with and really examining these paints to say, wait a second, these are really strong colors and I don't have to use as much as I was with the Reeves. So a Reeves blue was much different than a Prussian blue from Daniel Smith because there was so much more pigment in the Prussian blue that it kind of blew the student away. But that's something that even I come to terms with when I'm painting. I'll reach over and just grab whatever's close by and if I have a little set of, uh, of Reeves or a student grade product, um, I, I get the results that I, I should have expected but wasn't thinking of. Um, I won't mention a lot of brands out there because there's so many, but uh, some brands work well, some brands don't work well. So if you're buying cheap paper and you're buying cheap paint, then you're probably not going to be truly satisfied with the results. And it's all based on what we can afford, and I understand that. But for me, when I started my career, it was with uh, Windsor & Newton. That's all we had at the art store, and so that's all I bought because we didn't have the internet. We didn't know what was out there. So I was working with uh, Windsor & Newton, and that's all I knew. And they were great. I had no problem with them. But it wasn't until later that I found these other brands, and I said, geez, you know, this is such a great brand to use. I don't know why I didn't use this before, and it's it's great. But I would go back to the Windsor & Newton that I had, and it just didn't seem to have the same punch. So I started investing in other brands little by little, one tube here, a pan here, and building my sets. And, and I'm really glad I did that because now I have these great sets and uh, I'm really happy with the, at least knowing that the paints that I'm using are not cheap. And the, the paper that I use is generally really good paper. So I'm happy on those counts. Now with brushes, I'll be honest, some of the best brushes I have are cheap. They came from, you know, the dollar store. You know, there's some synthetic brushes I've gotten from the dollar store that I use all the time. Whereas I have really expensive brushes that I just never use. And I have one mop brush that I paid a lot of money for and I, I almost never use it because it's only really good for large areas. And I don't usually paint large areas. I paint very small. Uh, I do have a large 18 by 24, I think. Um, it's an arches block. And that's when I'll use that mop. But uh, in general usage, I almost never use it because it's just too big. It's a great brush. It's a really great brush, but I don't use it enough. And I almost feel guilty having it and having it just sit there. So some of the cheaper brushes that I have, uh, I have Princeton brushes. I have just no-name brushes. I have all these varieties of brushes, but I always seem to pick out the cheaper ones because they just seem to work better for me. I have a couple of go-to uh, really expensive brushes that I love, but overall, if especially if it's a quick thing, if I'm just sitting down for half an hour to an hour, I'm, I'm more than likely going to grab the cheap brushes, and those are what's in my travel kit too. Uh, one of my favorite brushes is the Pentel water brush, which, I don't know, they're like about $10 maybe or something like that, and I have Pentel water brushes that I've had for years and I keep using, and they're in my travel kit. These things have been beaten severely and they still work and I still use them and so if they work then use them if they're cheap it doesn't matter as long as it works for you and that goes for the paper the paints or the brushes if it's cheap and it works for you and you're having fun by all means continue going for it but if you want to up your own game then maybe invest in some nicer materials right it just makes common sense uh, number two a mistake that I constantly make is not planning out my painting first. For example, this painting here. I did a drawing and I thought it was fine. It was just, I don't even know what the drawing's about. It's just this kind of, <laughs> this this person smelling a flower and they don't look very happy. But um, they're finding happiness in the flower. And so that's that's what I was going for. But I didn't really plan this thing out. First of all, I drew it in on sketchbook paper. So it's not really watercolor paper. The materials that I'm using, you know, they're good materials. I'm using some uh, Mission Gold paints for this, but, uh, you know, I didn't need to use really high quality paints for this. I could have used something less because it is in a cheap sketchbook. Uh, not necessarily a cheap sketchbook, but it's in a sketchbook. Uh, but I didn't also, I should have planned out a color palette, and I didn't. I started just going in with green because I didn't have much time. I had an hour to do this, and... Uh, you know, I was trying to get it done in an hour. 
And so I just figured, okay, there's some viney things here. I'm going to paint those green and I'll go from there. So I went with the green and then I went with a contrast color, which is, you know, the complementary color red. And I thought, oh, that'll be fun. So I gave it a little twist. It's uh, the paint that I used for the red was rose matter. So I'm working with sort of a viridian green color and I'm working with this rose matter. Both have the same kind of temperature. So right there I'm making a mistake because the temperature of these two colors is very similar, which is okay, but I should have thought more closely about what I was going to do. So I didn't develop a color palette, which I almost always like to do before I start a painting. And um, the other thing is knowing where my white space is. It's a common mistake that I make in not planning out the white space, basically where I'm going to let the paper be the white space. So I'm not going to paint on certain areas to get highlights, white highlights, and I forget and I paint right into those areas, forfeiting the opportunity to let the paper come through. And I really, really enjoy when I am painting something and there's highlights and there's areas where I can, I can show reflections or whatever, and I can get it right. I love when that happens, when I get it right and it the paper comes through and I didn't paint those areas because I thought about it. And it makes me happy that I thought about it and it, you know, worked out. Uh, number three, when I work too fast or when I work too slow. When I'm working fast, I make lots of mistakes. Uh, mistakes like spattering my brush accidentally, uh, not letting the paint dry, uh, getting the bloom effect or getting getting bleeding when colors aren't completely dried yet. Uh, when I don't clean my brushes properly, when I just quickly rinse off a brush and didn't realize there's still, you know, I got uh, some purple left in there <laughs> and I'm going into my yellow and all of a sudden it's like, uh oh, the purple gets into the yellow pan and now I have to clean that out. So there's a lot of mistakes I make when I'm working too fast and I, I regret it later because, geez, if I just slowed down a little bit, it would have looked a lot better. Uh, another thing is working too slow. When I let the paint dry and I get a hard line that create is created, when I get unexpected results because the paint will pool into an area and I didn't lift it using a dry brush, so I get this pool of water you know, in a section of a painting that I could have easily just pulled off but I was working too slow and I didn't catch it in time. So now I have this, this puddle where, you know, there's blotching and all kinds of unexpected results. So you get these mistakes that could have easily been prevented if I just took my time and found my even pace, finding that, that tempo of painting that works for me instead of rushing or instead of working too slowly. Uh, number four is when I try to fix my mistakes. And I know we're all guilty of this, where we have an area of a painting that's either, you know, it's got a little bit of too much paint in one area or something. So we go in and we try to fix it. And it ends up ruining that area. And it shines. That That's like a glaring error. And I still make this mistake all the time. And I, I don't know why I do. Again, I blame it mostly on not preparing, not not setting aside the right amount of time, and just kind of just not listening to that inner voice that says leave it alone because sometimes the best mistakes are the ones we don't try to fix so if you have a mistake and it's sitting there leave it alone go to another part of the painting take a step out and go get some popcorn or something i don't know but um trying to fix mistakes can make the mistakes just so much worse uh number five water uh, not creating a color with enough water or using too much water. It's the, the water thing has been sort of that curse that has go, gone on for years with watercolor painters. I know that because we all make that mistake where we put too much water in and it dilutes it. And then when you lay down a wash, it's either too thin or it's, it's lifting up other colors because there's too much water there and you're not painting over a glaze. You're just kind of moving the glaze. And when you put uh, not enough water, you can run out of paint. And that's the worst thing. And that can happen in any painting. So you have um, you have this large area that you're trying to paint in and you are mixing sort of uh, phthalo blue. And you mix it into your well or your cup or whatever. And you add water and then you're painting along and then you realize very quickly, uh, I'm running out. <laughs> so all of a sudden you run out of that phthalo blue color. Well, it's easy enough to mix more, 
But what if you've mixed phthalo blue with, I don't know, uh, some kind of a yellow color to make a green? Now you've got to remix that color and hope that you get it as close to what you had because it's going to show up differently if otherwise. So um, without getting too much into it, the water thing, my advice to myself is always if I have a small area that I'm painting, use one well of the dish that I use. If I have a larger area, two wells of the same color and you can just drag the color that you're using over it or you can just make up enough uh, of a balance. And if it's a really large area, then I should really make three wells of that one color if I'm if I'm using that much. So again, that goes back to number two, which was the planning stage. If you plan it out first, you're not going to run into mistakes like not having enough water or having too much water. But, um, you know, that's something that you can do on the fly. It's not something you have to really think about. You can do it while you're setting up your painting. So water is always something to think about. Number six, not understanding colors or color mixing. And that can be a really tricky one, especially for new artists, because you open up your set of watercolors and let's say you have a set of 12 watercolors. Uh, and that's, to some people, that's what you're working with is those 12 colors and not realizing that you can mix other colors from those 12 or even six or even three. Uh, when it goes back to the limited color palette, using a set of primaries is the best way to go because you can use red, yellow, and blue and mix the colors you need. Convenience colors are nice because it's multiple pigments mixed together to create, create colors that are convenient to have right on hand, like purples, greens, and oranges, and so forth. But not understanding how they go together or how they work can end up with results like making mud or uh, creating a contrast that you didn't intend or a lot of other things can happen. So just taking some time and understanding color theory and looking into it. I know color theory very well, but it's all theory and it's all in my head and what I've read and what I've studied. So when I go into watercolor, sometimes it doesn't work the way I think it's going to work because watercolor can be tricky sometimes. And if you don't, if you don't mix the right way, it can, it can take a turn real quick. So that's when, again, planning, going back to number two, the planning stage, if we plan out our colors and we really have a good feel for, for what we're going into ahead of time, then we can avoid making mistakes. And I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had a nice, you know, just a nice sunset or a nice, a nice look of a, a painting that's gone wrong because I decided to add just some <laughs> complimentary color to a background and all of a sudden it just turns to brown and it's not a nice brown or the the nice blue sky suddenly turns gray and that's not what I wanted so taking a little time and understanding and doing swatching and testing and things like that and saying okay I'm using um, I don't know I'm using lemon yellow and I'm using uh, say phthalo green and I'm mixing them together to make this bright green color and having a test little swatch to the side can save a lot of time on having headaches later and making mistakes so moving on from that number seven kind of goes into the same thing with value understanding value where your shades and your darks and your lights are coming in that's where my painting here that you're seeing fails because I wasn't thinking about value when I was painting it. I went into it, started painting, and all of a sudden the front is kind of the same temperature as the background. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where if I had planned my values better, then the painting would have had the character pop more and the flowers pop more and the background would have been either darker or lighter and, and kind of set back more. But I didn't plan out my values properly, so unfortunately this piece is flat and it looks flat and I know it looks flat. Do I care? Yeah, I care. I, <laughs> you know, I want to have a nice painting, but uh, I'm not worried about it because this was just for fun. And this was just because I had some time to make a painting and I did what I did. I can learn from this. And every time I flip through this book and I see this painting, I'm going to be like, yeah, I remember that. So uh, it's a good reminder for me to take the time again, going back to number two in that planning stage 
and plan out my values. What What is the most prominent thing I want to see? And that should be the foreground. And most times, that's the most colorful thing. And if you go back in space, things get lighter as they go back in space. So if I've got you know, a landscape painting I, and I have like a, uh, a windmill or a silo, a farm or whatever, uh, that's going to be in the foreground and that's going to have the stronger colors, but the mountains in the background are going to get lighter and lighter and lighter as they go back. And I can change the color to match sort of the sunrise in the background or whatever. So understanding that value and going back to the last one about color mixing and so forth is really important. I, I highly suggest folks look into their color theory if you're not sure. Uh, just go on the internet, go on Google and just, you know, do a quick study of, of color theory, uh, read a couple of lines, read a, read a paragraph, read an article, and just learn about color and how color goes. And that goes for even veteran artists who, you know, you think you know what you're doing with paint and how it mixes, but sometimes you paint yourself into a corner and you say, geez, you know, I have all these great colors, but I, I have made a mistake somewhere along the line and now it's turning to mud and how do I fix it? Well, knowing the color theory and knowing how to plan ahead is probably the best part. Again, creating a palette is going to help tremendously in the long run of a painting. And and whether it's, you know, using red, yellow, and blue, or even burnt sienna, yellow ochre, and Prussian blue, those limited color palettes are so valuable in learning how to control the different paint effects and different ways it's going to lay out. So that's always probably the most paramount thing is just planning out the color and the value scheme. And it's going to help tremendously at the end of the painting. Now, another mistake that I constantly make because I'm lazy and I rush <laughs> is using clean water. And it's something that I know a lot of people do because for me, I have these jam jars that I use. I have two of them. One has clean water, one has dirty water, but eventually the dirty water seeps over into the clean water and I start mixing brushes in dirty water and that dirty water gets into the colors that I'm mixing and can actually affect the color that I'm trying to lay down. So if you've got a really nice Hansa yellow and you're using dirty water, it's going to come out in your Hansa yellow. It's going to just muddy it up just enough that it's not going to be the effect you wanted or whatever color it is, especially the bright colors. And, uh, I do this all the time because, again, I'm lazy. I have a jug of distilled water that I use for my clean water, and then I have a little, uh, it's an old container that I pour my dirty water into, and then I dispose of it later. So there's no excuse for me not to be using clean water. I have everything right here, and it's always available, yet I do the same thing over and over because I'm rushing and I'm not taking the time to prepare and I rinse my brush in a dirty, <laughs> dirty glass of water. So being aware of using clean water is huge. Uh, another one, number nine, is know when to stop working. I always, uh, this is such a, such a thing for me, is I tend to overwork. And that leads to a lot of different mistakes where if you're overworking a painting, you're going to go back in and overglaze. So you're going to lose some of your details and some of those beautiful, wonderful effects that the watercolor has. And if you overwork it, you lose them. And that's the uh, that's the biggest crime for me is that a lot of the sketches and a lot of the fun stuff that I'm working on, I don't want to show it because I overworked it. And uh, this piece here, I went back in and I laid down another glaze of that rose matter color, the red color. And I lost some of the details that I had put in there and I, it made me a bit sad. So, you know, I'll go back into it with colored pencil and, and kind of, you know, make it pop a little bit. But I didn't want to have to do that. And that's that's sort of the last resort is going back in with like a white gel pen or white gouache or a colored pencil, a white colored pencil and adding in highlights and things because I didn't plan properly. And uh, that's that's my own fault. Planning properly and, and knowing what's going to happen before you do it. It's kind of huge. And lastly, I'll say this, number 10, is expecting perfection. We all want to control these paints. We all want to control the materials. We all want to control what we're creating. 
and none of us are perfect and our painting is never going to come out perfect. I know a lot of artists and I've seen a lot of art that to me looks perfect and I'm, I'm blown away every time I see amazing watercolor work. And uh, those people are people that really understand and plan and know what they're doing and they avoid these kind of mistakes because they take the time to prepare and they take the time to know what they're doing. And uh, for me, I, I try not to expect the most. I, I expect that I'm going to create something that is palatable, that I like. But in this kind of a scenario where I have a half an hour or I have an hour, I'm not expecting perfection here. I'm just looking to create something because the creative spirit in me, just like in you, needs to create something. I need to put something down, whether it's cooking, whether it's baking, whether it's sewing or crocheting. We need to be creative for some reason. And for me, drawing and painting is that's the stuff I love. So, you know, I can pick up a guitar and play my guitar, but I don't have that as a keepsake. It's just sort of like playing a guitar as a skill that you can develop, but you never have anything tangible to come back with unless you record it or whatever. But, um, you know, with a painting, it's something that you get to keep for later. So I want it to look good, but I also understand that timing is of the essence and I can't be perfect if I'm rushing a painting. And I'll, I know I'll never be perfect. So I try to get as close as I can for my skill set. And uh, for me, the perfect painting is the one that I can put away and smile and say, you know what? It, it may not look great to anybody else, but wow, I had a really good time painting it. It felt really good inside, very satisfying. Uh, I have that peace of mind, that immersive meditative experience when I painted that picture. And that's exactly what we all want to experience is that, that not quick rush of, of dopamine or something, like you get with um, a video game where you, you get this burst of dopamine from playing a video game and beating a level. This is a natural dopamine rush, which is the best kind, which is a very slow uh, injection of, of chemicals in our bodies that make us feel happy. It's kind of like when we exercise. It's, it's a normal burst of the chemicals in our body, whether it's adrenaline or dopamine or whatever. I don't, I'm not a science guy for <laughs> the body chemicals, but I do know that when we do something that makes us happy naturally, it's the kind of delivery that is slow paced, it's slow delivery, and it feels good. Whereas if you do something that's not real, like, and I use video games as the good example, it's a false sense of, of achievement. It's a false sense of, of reward. We get hit with this dopamine rush if you, you know, win the race in the video game or if you, you, you know, do something in the video game that you get the reward. Long story short is just that, you know, when we're creating a painting or creating a drawing or anything, pastels, acrylics, doesn't matter. That sense of accomplishment is a wonderful feeling and we can keep moving on through the day and get through the, the week or whatever it is, knowing that we have this ability to just sit down, immerse, meditate, and enjoy. And that's the whole point of this all the way through. And so that's why I wanted to share these common mistakes that I make that are, are killing my paintings, <laughs> so to speak. But um, I can overlook the mistakes I make because I'm happy with the fact that I'm just able to sit down and create a painting. That for me is the biggest reward. And I will try not to make these mistakes. And this video is a great way for me to remind myself, and maybe it's hitting something with you too, um, where I can say, hey, you know what? I make mistakes, but I can try to control those mistakes. I can't control the perfection. So I might as well try to control what mistakes I make. So anyway, I hope this video was enjoyable for you. Um, you can see here, this is the final piece. And I'm going to show you how, like, when you do the tonal thing, you can see that if I go to a gray tone, it just kind of shuts it down and the whole thing is flat. Whereas if I bump up the background to darkness, you can see how the character pops. And the reverse is the same when you lighten the background. The character still pops off the light background. But, um, you know, there's a balance there. And that's what I'm always striving for is that balance. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. 
Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. I'd love to bring you more content like this. Uh, this is one of my longer videos, so I usually don't make them this long. But uh, if you watch till the end, thank you so much for watching. And uh, just try to come up with a plan and have a good time. Anyway, I'll stop talking now. So <laughs> have a great day. Thank you so much. And as always, God bless.